First, um, an apology from Amos. He knows you don't like him. He, I mean, you're supposed to because he's in the Bible, but the truth is if you, if you talk to him for very long, you read him for very long, you like want to cancel him because he's just, he's so negative. Except for five verses at the end of the book, there's nine chapters, except for the last five verses in the whole book, which feel a little contrived to me, but I digress. Most of this stuff's negative. In fact, all of it's negative. Uh, so it's hard to take. The sermon is, it's disjointed. Somebody once described a cross-eyed discus thrower who doesn't set any records, but he keeps the crowd alert. <laughs> Every time Amos starts to preach, it's duck and cover. He, there are several bursts and starts and then restarts, and, and you never really know where he's going to go, but it's like he's always mad. I mean, he starts out in the first verse, the first time, he opens his mouth, and he says, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. That, that's, that's his introduction. <laughs> no, that's the start of his introduction. Then he proceeds to go into a series of invectives about six different countries that surround Israel. Uh, this is a sample. This is in his introduction. <laughs> You're going to love this. God will send fire on Hazael, break down the gates of Damascus, destroy the king of Ashdod, and turn his hand against Ekron until the last Philistine is dead. Then he says, God will send fire on the walls of Tyre, consume the fortresses of Basra, set fire to the walls of Rabbah, then send a violent tornado to finish things off. <laughs> the word of the Lord. <clears throat> yeah, with a question mark. It's like, thanks be to God. So if you're in Israel, you're loving this because these are the people around you and you don't like them either. Some of them hate you. So you're sort of glad that God's going to like tear into these other people, but then you discover he has saved his best fire for you. This is what he says to his own people. Yahweh brought you out of Egypt and gave you this land. He raised up prophets from among your sons, and what did you do? You made the youth in training break training. You told the prophets to stop prophesying even though they were telling you the truth. So God, <laughs> this part that's hard to read, God is going to crush you like a cart is crushed when overloaded. The swift will not escape. The strong will lose their strength. The warrior will run for his life. The skilled archers won't make it. Fast runners won't make it. Chariot drivers won't make it. Even the bravest among you won't make it. They'll all run for their lives stripped naked. There will be wailing in the streets, cries of anguish in the public square. Farmers will come from the fields weeping. Mourners will line up to wail. And then you will know that Yahweh <laughs> is in your midst. Do you, you see where this is going? It, it never gets better. So I was supposed to preach on this last week. And I just, I thought, there is no way, I can't do this. Because I was going to introduce prophets to you guys, right? And I thought, oh, there is no way. I'm going to go up there and say, hear the word of Amos. <laughs> oh, oh, they're going to burn me in effigy. So when the king of Israel hears this, he goes off. He gets angry. And when Amos, the prophet, hears that the king is mad, he doubles down. He says to the king, Hear the word of the Lord. Your wife will become a prostitute. Your children will die by the sword. Your personal property will get confiscated and then divided. And you yourself will die a prisoner in a foreign country. <laughs> he won't quit. He calls the country complacent. He calls their women fat cows. See what I mean? You'd cancel them. You should. He says their worship is apostasy, their justice is poison, their righteousness is bitter, and their military are cowards. So if you read through this four or five times, 
uh, you're having a hard time finding where exactly is the gospel in all of this. You're waiting for the news to break, and it seems never to break. Best advice I had, you guys, came from somebody who said, these are not the sermons of Amos. These are Amos's notes. And that's why they seem to burst and start and change. And that's why they jump all over the place is because what we have is a collection of Amos's notes. He preached for like five years. You can read the book of Amos in like 10 minutes. So you've got five years worth of preaching in 10 minutes worth of stuff. So what they've done is they've selected (laughs) for better the best of Amos, right? And this becomes for us the sermons of Amos. But when I read that, the lights went on because if these are his notes, then you have to look through them rather than at them. You have to use his words to try and get into the mind of Amos. And here in chapter 3, In the first two verses in chapter 3, for the first time, the lights went on. It reads like this. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O Israel, against the whole family that he brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the nations, therefore I will punish you for your sins. In chapter 5, verse 12, I think it is, it's close to that, he says, seek good, hate evil, and then maybe Yahweh will come and live among you like you say he does. Then maybe God will show mercy to the remnant of of his people. That's where the light started to come on. Why is the prophet so mad? Because Israel is his chosen ones. And they're behaving like the rest of the nations. And there is a downside to being chosen by God. The standards are higher for you, and so he will punish you when you violate those standards. You tracking? I know it's, there's not as many of us here. I'm going to need you to talk. If you're, are you guys tracking? Oh, thank you. So as I said last week, I'm going to recapitulate some of this stuff right now. This is the nation of Israel. We said last week, if this is Israel, there are three forces at work. One is the rulers, one are the priests or the religious people, and the third one are the prophets, or in those, these are the false prophets, or in those days, the cultural elite. These three, we said last week, were in cahoots with each other. They didn't necessarily like each other, But ultimately, they all three believed and promoted the same thing. Once in a while, the rulers of the country might pass a law that the cultural elite would celebrate, but the religious people would oppose. But that would only be for a short while. Eventually, the religious people would agree with the laws and the cultural elite because it was in their best interest to do so. Yeah, are you there? And because these three are the three entities you would hope would redeem the nation, but they are themselves responsible for the downfall, there really isn't much of a future. And so the public is pessimistic. Some of them, we said, are calling for a revolution, burn it all down. Others of them are calling for a reformation, change the laws, change the leaders, and make everybody obey. And then the Wesleyans are calling for revival. The Holy Spirit or God will come upon us in a mighty way, and he will sort it all out. What the prophet Micah and Amos predict 
is that God is going to do something inside of the nation that is set apart from the nation. And he calls it a remnant. A remnant is a fragment of the whole. It's actually a fractal of the whole. A remnant is a part of the whole that has all of the things the whole has, only it doesn't have all the problems of the whole. So God is going to use a remnant of people, watch it, to be to the nation what he hoped the nation would have been to the world. Say that again. God is going to use the remnant to be to the nation what he wanted the nation to be to the world. So this remnant will have a different leader and a different center. It will live in a different way consistently. Now the thing that I want to underscore that I didn't last week <clears throat> is that the remnant is not just a different kind of person. It is a different way of redeeming the country. Listen, everybody wants the country to be redeemed. The people that are burning the streets down and those that are calling for a reformation and those that are calling for revival all think that things need to change. And so they want the nation to be different. And so do the people of the remnant. This isn't just about living different. This is a change in strategy. Are you there? Is that making sense? So the idea that God is going to use a smaller community to be to the nation what the nation should be to the world is a significant shift in strategy not just a smaller set of people. The question then for Israel is how will the nation be redeemed? And the problem with the revolution or the reformation in the revival is not that these things are morally wrong, it's that they don't work. The problem is not moral, it's pragmatic. Some of you got caught in the whole protests in the streets and you took different sides arguing the rightness or the wrongness of it, but we missed the real question. The question isn't whether the protests were morally right or wrong, the question always was, is this gonna work? Does anger, even righteous anger, bring about the righteousness of God? That's the question. Are you there? So the reason the prophet is so upset is because the remnant is acting like the nation and the nation is acting like the world and Yahweh is saying you are my people I chose you and so I punish you I chose you so I punish you I punish you because I chose you there is a downside to being chosen. Last week, and my grandkids were here. One is five, one's 18 months. They're out in the backyard, and I hear my daughter, their mother, start yelling at them. And I hear her say, you better turn that off, put that down, you better back away. I'm going to count to three or I'm going to ruin your morning. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, she's sort of overreacting. So I go outside and take a look at this. And the five-year-old has found the garden hose. He's turned it on 
He's already sprayed the house, already sprayed the steps. He sprayed himself and he's taken aim at his 18 month old sister. And that's when his mother stepped in and said, I'm gonna count to three and if you don't put that down by three, I'm gonna wreck your morning. <clears throat> she got to two and he started moving for the faucet. I was proud. We taught her that. We used to say, I count to three, and when I get to three, negotiations are off. That's not the time when you sit and say, now, now, let's talk about this. No, no, you talk about this on one. On number two, you do it, and then on number three, you are left with the wrath of God through his servants, Steve and Lori. That's how it works. And it only needs proof of concept one time. There's got to be one time you get the three, then you got to get up, turn it off, put it down, and go do what you said you were going to do. And that is indelibly stamped in her mind. And from that day on, it is remarkable how God opens their hearing at two. Before that, they don't speak English, can't understand you, can't even hear you. But boy, the miracles, the quickening of understanding when you get to two, their eyes are opened. So she got to two and he walked over and he grabbed the hose and he turned it off and held on to it a little longer and then he dropped it. Then he said the unthinkable. He said to his mother, but I can do whatever I want. <laughs> oh man, when he said that, I looked at her and I, I went, oh, there is a justice built right into the universe. Oh, this is a good day. But I was nervous, so I got out of there. I looked through the window and she got down. She got right up in his grill and she gave him the what for. Then she said, you will go over and sit on that step and you will not move or breathe until I tell you to move. And she looked like she meant it. So we went over and sat on that step and he did not move. I got bored, so I went inside. Long time later, he come walking in all penitent. She said, you got something to say to your granddaddy? said, I'm sorry. She said, for what? For saying that I can do whatever I want. <laughs> she said, what did you learn? He said, that I can't do whatever I want. <laughs> now in this parable, let me point a couple things out. The reason that his mother has authority over him is because she is his mother. It's not because she's bigger than him, though she is. It's because she gave birth to him and she is his mother. And because she is his mother, she has standards for that boy that she does not have for other children. If the neighborhood boy starts spraying his daughter, she'll care, but she probably won't go over the fence because her standards for her boy are such that he must behave according to those standards. There's too much at stake. The boy, he wants to create room. He wants freedom before he knows the consequences of it. He has no idea what the world will do to him if he does whatever he wants. And by the time he finds out, it'll be too late. And so his mother, acting now, forces him to behave to the standards that are in his long-term best interest. Is she mad? You bet she's mad. In fact, if she's not mad, then she's not the parent we thought she was. Now the only thing that's left is for the child to decide how he will respond. Will he turn and run from his mother 
Or will he submit himself and go back to his mother? Will he defend himself, say it's not his fault, or will he humble himself? Do you see where this is going? People listen to this. The reason God has authority to tell you how to live is not because he's bigger than you. It's because he gave birth to you. He has the authority to give you his law because he chose you. You did not choose him. He chose you. All you said on the day you came to Christ was, be it unto me as you have said. That's what Mary said. But you giving consent to God's plan for your life does not make anything happen any more than Mary's consent can create a virgin birth. God came to you one day with a plan for your life and you said, be it unto me as you have said. And so the authority of God, his right to give you laws rests on the fact that you are chosen by God. But there is a downside to being chosen. It means that his standards for you are high. You will say too high. You'll say they're unfair. But they're unfair. They seem high to you because he has chosen you. And he wants you to be to the nation what the nation was supposed to be to the world. And that's why the standards are so high. And is God angry? You bet he's angry. In fact, if he doesn't get angry, he's not the parent we thought he was. He should get angry because there is too much at stake. What remains then is how the people of God, those of us in the room right now who feel that God is picking on them, who feel that God has been harsh to them, that God has done things to them that seem out of his character, He is perfectly capable of doing this. What remains is the question of whether we will run away from him or whether we will run to him. Will we take a defensive posture and talk about how mean he is or unfair he is to our friends or will we take a more humble in quiet posture. Are you there? It's quiet. And once we apologize to God, is the matter over? Do we just move on and things go back to the way they were before? Or do we actually have plans in place to make sure that we never do that again? And that, church, is why God seems so harsh. I don't know how spent your batteries are. We could do the benediction right now. Do uh, you want me to go seven more minutes? We got to hurry. What is at stake in Israel? And this part's the hard part. I apologize in advance. What is at stake in Israel? Primar or, uh, in the book of Amos is primarily the economy. He must say it a thousand times. He says, you oppress the poor and you crush the needy. He says, your rulers take bribes. The judges ask for gifts. The powerful just do whatever they want. And it's the poor and it's the needy that take the beating. And the prophet is upset about this. So if you want to understand the prophet Amos, you have to think about the economy of Israel at the time. So to save you time, I went and read it a few more times. And I think I can identify four big problems in the economy of Israel. And I just got to say in advance, I am not talking about us. Okay? 
you'll walk away and say, that was, no. I'm just talking about Israel. You can do the rest yourself. One of the symptoms of their disease, he said, was an undisciplined pursuit of more. The way they did this is some people wanted to work on the Sabbath and others wanted to work on holidays. He said, some of you are saying, when will the holidays be over? When will the Sabbath be done so we can get back to work? Another way they did it was, they, these are his words, you skimp on the measure, but you charge even more. What some today call shrinkflation. You lower the amount, but you raise the price. Then he said, you tip the scales. When you go to measure things, you, you, you weight the scales so you don't. Then he says, you sweep the floor and you put the sweepings along with the wheat. And then you sell the sweepings and the wheat as if it were all wheat. You can see what they're doing, can't you? There's a group of people in the country who are obsessed with making more and more and more. And so every decision they make is made because at the end of the day, it'll make us even more money. There's a second problem, which I'm calling the commodification of everything. He says in chapter 2, verse 6, you sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. And then in chapter 8, verse 6, he says, you buy the righteous for silver and you buy the needy for a pair of sandals. In other words, you're selling and you're buying people because profits are more important to you than people. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 22 said, you build large houses on the backs of the poor. You don't pay people what they're worth. Again, I'm just talking about the prophet. The third is a growing chasm. Because these two things are happening, there is a growing chasm in Israel between the rich and the poor. He says in chapter 5, verse 15, you force the poor to give you grain. What they were doing was the rich people were buying up all the land and then they were renting the land to the poor. And when the poor farmer would grow stuff on the land, he would pay the rich not only rent, but he would have to pay a large portion of his crops just to keep the land. So at the end of the day, the person who was already rich was working less and getting more while the poor farmer was working more and getting less. Is this making sense? That's why he says... Amos says, some of you lie on beds inlaid with ivory. You drink wine by the bowlful, but you cannot grieve at the losses of another person. So wide was the chasm that the winners could not empathize with the losers. There is one more. There was the confiscation of property through legal means. Micah says, Prophet. Micah says, these people down here, they lie in their bed at night and plot evil. And then they carry it out in the morning because it is in their power to do so. That sounds like it came out of the paper. 
He says, they covet fields and so they take them. They want people's houses and so they just grab them. He says they defraud a person even of his inheritance. And the way they did it was they changed the laws and they changed the taxes and they changed the system and they leveraged their offices. That is why the prophet Amos and Micah said, the judges want bribes and the rulers accept gifts. And they, these are their words, and they dictate whatever their hearts desire. You hear in the language here. So right now you're thinking, oh yeah, I know. No, listen, he's talking about a system. This is the system that angered the prophet. And what he's saying is, it's the people in the remnant that are doing these things. Is God angry? You bet he's angry. But he's angry because you're chosen. And there's a downside to that. Now use your imagination. What if God could find a community of people that lived fundamentally differently. What if God had a handful of people who actually believed that the reason for working was not to pay the bills? That the reason for profit was never to get rich? What if somebody actually believed that? What if there were people in key positions of any society that believed people were more important than things? And so when they bent the rules, as only leaders can do, they always bent them for the good of people, never for the purpose of gain. There. What if there was a community that lived in an impoverished city, but the people of that community were generous? They invented ways of pushing things away instead of hoarding them. This is what got me thinking about Wesley's, John Wesley, it is a Wesleyan church. Wesley said the proper use of money involved three things. Earn all you can, save all you can. Do you know the other one? You guys are good. This is like a class, ain't it? And these things he said were connected. And I thought, probably everybody in the room right now is good at one of these things. All of you are. Some of you are good at giving naturally. You're generous. Others of you are good at earning. Everything you touch turns to money. Uh, I'm Dutch, so I'm good at saving. So like I was telling in in our house at Christmas time, uh, a, a, a gift is good, but when the person says it was on sale, it's a great gift. We're like, oh, that is awesome. I was mediocre until you told me that. Oh, I may never use it, but whoa, this is an amazing gift. So I am naturally good at saving, which means giving is a learned behavior. Now you can learn it, I have, but it doesn't come natural for a tightwad. Okay? But there are people, as I say, who are people of God that are really good at earning. And the problem is, it's the rest of the people of God that don't like them. All right. And some of you call that piety. It's probably not. It's probably envy. In fact, I think I, I said in the first hour, this is probably the, the prejudice against the wealthy in our country right now is probably the only form of prejudice still acceptable. If you said about any other class of people what is said regularly about the wealthy from our leaders, you'd call it prejudice. 
And you'd be right. But there's a set of assumptions that are always in place. If you have a lot, you must have got it dishonestly. And you must hoard it. But what if there were people who were really good at this, became even better at this? How are you doing? We are the people of God. God, church, God has called every one of you out of Egypt and into the promised land. Are you hearing me? That is who you are. God has called you out of the brickyard and into the festival, into the feast. When God calls his people to be different with their resources, he is not calling us to win at this game. He's calling us to an entirely different economy. We don't even think about things the way the rest of the country does. And so, of course, we don't handle things in the way the rest of the country does. We see people and things differently. Your father knows what you have need of before you even ask. You don't need to worry. You don't need to hoard. You don't need that relationship with things God has given you. So hear the words of Jesus. It's as if Jesus came right out of the desert. It's like he picked the last piece of man right off the ground and come walking right into the church. Holding the manna that only God provides. Listen to what he says to his children. No one can serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and you'll avoid the other. You can't serve both God and things. You just, you just can't. So don't worry whether you have enough of whatever it is you want. Because you know that life is more than whatever you want. I mean, look at the birds, look at the flowers. They don't toil, they don't spin, yet they have everything they want. <laughs> and you're worth more than they are, and besides, your father knows what you need before you even ask. So. So here's what you should do. You should seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will come to you as you need them. But, but seek first the kingdom of God. Mm. And don't store those things up on earth because they get old or they get taken. You should store things in heaven where they never get old and they never get taken because at the end of the day, wherever you put your treasure, well, that's where your heart and your thoughts will always be. And when God 
gives you things. Don't be like the servant who buries them. Rather, invest in something worthwhile so that it will be worth even more when Jesus comes. Then, then you'll have plenty to give to those who ask you and you won't have to turn away from those who want to borrow from you. And you'll give to those who cannot pay you back. You are free to love even your enemies. Because when you do that, you will be acting like true children of God. The word of the Lord.